Welcome everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about neurodiversity. This is not a technical talk for once for me. Um, and it, let's just start figuring out what neurodiversity is, shall we? So it sounds like diversity but has the neuro word in there. So if you look online you see a definition like is the range of differences in individual brain function and behavioral traits regarded as part of normal variation in the human population. Not very clear. Individual brain functions, normal variation. In fact, there's another definition that says, a concept where neurological differences are to be recognized and respected as any other human variation. So, there's people that have a brain that is wired in a different way, and that is to be considered part of the normal things of being human. Okay? That sounds, sounds like it. So, it sounds a little bit strange, right? So, when we talk about neurodiversity, you may have heard of these other conditions. Autism, ADHD, dyslexia, and dyspraxia. These are the four most common conditions that uh, uh, take part of being a different brain configuration. And today I'm going to focus on autism because otherwise it will be just too wide. So, there's a long way to go. We all start with first step is awareness. People have to be aware that these conditions exist. <coughs> so, we have to know what they are, what they mean. And that we are more or less covered nowadays. There is a Sesame Street puppet that has autism. There is one power ranger that has autism. There's one uh, Overwatch character that has autism. So it's getting mainstream, it's getting more common. People are aware of this. Next step then is going into acceptance. That when you see someone having these conditions, you actually accept it as something normal. Something that is part of the normal variation of the human population. But we don't want to stop there. We want to get into the inclusion part where these people can form part of society as any other person. That is a little bit more complicated than it looks like. So, one in a hundred kids have autism spectrum disorder in Ireland. This figure varies from country to country. In the States, for example, it's one in 64. It's actually really, really common. Because of the number of people we have here, we probably have a couple of people with autism in the audience. <coughs> If you look at your extended friends and family, someone that has been impacted by the condition, we're looking at a number that is probably close to 40 people. So it is very, very important. It's very, very common. It's not something that happens one in a thousand. It happens more than 1%. So how does autism look like? Well, it doesn't look like anything. Autism is an invisible disability. People that have autism do not have any physical traits that you can tell and look at someone and say, oh, this person has autism. No, you can't. Right? Autism is invisible. And by the way, if someone has autism, you tell them, oh, you don't look like having autism. That's quite true. <laughs> so yeah, I know you <clears throat> really want some specifics, right? So how does autism look like? There must be some traits, some specifics of this condition. Yes, there are many traits, and that's why it's called an spectrum. So, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. The variations on the traits, conditions, symptoms is very, very different from person to person. The soul also very different from as any other person, actually. There's people with low IQ, high IQ, normal IQ. It's essentially as normal as normal people, but with a lot of other traits that also vary, so real. Each person with autism is unique. I know, you, you want really some specifics. Okay. You may have noticed that I skipped my introduction slide. So, hello everyone, I'm Raul. I have Asperger syndrome, which is part of the autism spectrum disorder. This comes with a few traits. One of them is that I'm not really good at reading people. I'm really bad at having high eye contact and I'm really struggling with one-on-one -on -one conversations. So when I, was, when I was younger, I find that computers were a lot more interesting than people. They were reliable, they were consistent, were lots of fun, so I started getting into computers. That goes into another typical autistic trait, which is special interest. We have interest, and it got into our head, and we cannot think about anything else. 
computer was one of them for me. And then later, I realized that talking to audiences like this is a lot easier than talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. And there's also a lot of information about it online. So I started coming to conferences, and I started being part of the GDG Dublin. And with my special interest on uh, computers, I ended up doing a lot of Android. And you put one or the other together, I ended up being a Google developer expert for Android, which is lots of fun. And I think my autism had a great part of me ending up being a Google developer expert. I do have other special interests. Like, I love fantasy. Uh, Lord of the Rings, I love Lord of the Rings. I, I know you're thinking, everybody loves Lord of the Rings. Yeah, but I actually know how to write in Tengwar. At this language, it's called Tengwar. It's a graphic. You can actually write in English on it, but you can also write in Quaya. And Quaya is the official ancient uh, Elvis tomb. It's not the one they use in the movies. The one they would use in the movies is called Sindarin, which is newer, but there's not enough information about it, so we couldn't build a grammar. But there's not from Quenya when you read the Silmarillion, so there's a grammar for it. You can actually learn to speak Quenya. And of course, you can read the Lord of the Rings inscriptions in the One Ring. Because it's very similar to Tengor, but it's corrupted. It's the logo, the tongue of murder, and its grammar is also quite similar to Tengor. Uh, I could go on, but I think you get the idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, the big problem is that autism has very high levels of unemployment. This is a survey that was done on 2,000 adults with autism on October past year. Less than 60% have a full-time job. 77% of the people that are unemployed want to work. And this also leads farther down the line to other problems like anxiety and depression. So this really big problem, we're talking about the big percentage of the population wanting to have a, work, a job and not being able to. But where? Like these people are a little bit weird. I know I am weird. So where do all these people think that they can work on? Arts. It's very interesting. It's quite common on people without this. And when I say it's quite common, I mean it's in a spectrum, everyone is different, but some things are a little bit common. It's quite common to be a visual thinker. And if you put together being a visual thinker and perceiving the world in a different way, artist is actually a pretty good match. I think, uh, yeah, you have a kind of logical mind, we really get into things, ideas, is really something that we like. Admin and office work is another one. So for, for people on the spectrum, the world is very chaotic, very weird, sometimes scary. And try to get routines and things in order to try to minimize the chaos and feel more comfortable. So when you give someone without this an office work when they have to classify everything, that's, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, scientific R&D, similar to IT, for the same reasons, it's really, really appealing. If you have a particular special interest on something and you can do research on this, you're gonna do research like 24 hours a day. If you go home, you're gonna sleep, you're gonna dream about it, you're gonna wake up in the morning, you're gonna think about it. It's gonna be like really your focus for, for research. And lastly, a library or museum. If your special interest is not something you can research, but it's something you can have a museum about. It should be the best guide that the museum is ever gonna have, or if you have to take care of the museum, you're just gonna rock it. For example, I, I know a person that was really much into trains and ended up being the director of the National Train Museum in Spain. So it's actually pretty cool. And neurodiversity is actually a win-win. We are not looking for charity. We're looking for something that we, we're giving something to the companies that can work with people without this. It's not that the companies are giving people without this chance because it's, it's something, ah, oh, we have to do some, something with people with disabilities. People on the spectrum also give a lot back. And I'm gonna get into that. Mm -hmm. So, back to inclusion, it's not everything that steps out of line and does abnormal must necessarily be inferior. This, is, this was said by Hans Asperger. As you may imagine, this is the person that discovered Asperger syndrome back in the 50s, if I remember correctly. So, people that are different, don't really need to be inferior, they're just different. Uh, <coughs> so this has been called the engineer's disorder as well. Um, there's another quote from Hans Asperger, 
It seems that for success in science or art, a dose of autism is essential. So if you reverse this quote, means that every successful person in, in, in science or art has a dose of autism. That doesn't mean that they are on the spectrum, but that they have the typical traits of autism to a certain degree. So it really fits the engineer's mindset with the autism traits. It's actually a pretty good match for a lot of us. And STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, actually benefits from autism. Without autistic people, technology won't be where it is today. Um, of course, we cannot go back in time and do an assessment of people that are dead. But it's believed that Einstein and Tesla, for example, were showing a lot of autistic traits and they may be on the spectrum. We don't know, we cannot go back in time and do a physical assessment, but they definitely did show some traits. So these people that keep having the special interest and pushing forward and trying different things from completely different angles have been pushing IT and scientific R&D for ages. All this is not new, it's been there since the very beginning of ages. So, I think you know this guy. This, this, this guy is uh, Alan Turing. If you've seen the movie about his life, The Imitation Game, he's actually portrayed as someone that is extremely socially awkward and with a very focused interest on computers. And when I saw the movie, it was very obvious to me that they were picturing someone without this. <clears throat> of course, we cannot go back in time to assess Turing, but I do believe he had some serious autism. And he said this, it's interesting. Sometimes it is the people no one can imagine anything of who do the things no one can imagine. And I think it fits very well the current thinking of these people without this cannot really do. What can they do? And if you give them a chance, they're probably gonna do things no one can imagine. I'm gonna give you another example. I think you know this company. This is Logan, yeah? So think different. So we perceive the world in a different way because our brain is wired differently. So even when we think inside our box, the box of normal people is here. Our box is here. Whenever we think outside the box, it looks like we're thinking outside the box. And when we think outside the box, we're just somewhere completely different. So people without this will bring you a completely different perspective into problems. They will think differently naturally. So there's a lot of things that can be interesting for IT. So the world needs all kinds of minds. This, uh, this woman, Temple Grandin, is the, one of the most famous autism advocates in the world. There's a movie about her life as well. And he claim, she claims that we need all types of minds working together to actually move forward as a society. And I think it's a very, a very beautiful thought. So, as you may have figured by now, the traits of an autistic person and the characteristics of a traditional geek are kind of aligned. So there was this guy, Steve Silverman, that made a study about the prominence of autism in Silicon Valley and how these things match together, and he called this article the Geek Syndrome. This was an article from 2011, this New York Times, it got a lot of attention. He thought it was worth exploring, he spent a few years researching the condition and this, the history and everything. And he wrote a very interesting book called Neuro Tribes. That's about the story of all this. There's also going to be a movie about it. Uh, it's been agreed already. You see, we, we're actually getting very well into the awareness part of it. So, as I've been saying, neurodiversity in IT is actually quite good. The autism spectrum disorder condition has been revised over the years. When I was younger, this condition did not exist as it exists today. So I was not diagnosed when I was uh, 12. I was diagnosed when I was 40. If I would be born today, I would have been diagnosed when I was 12. So there's a lot of people on IT that are probably on the spectrum, but they don't know. And honestly, it's not that important. IT is a very good place to be autistic because it's full of geeks and everybody has experience. It's actually quite nice. We have to export this feeling to other areas. We have to make efforts to make it even more inclusive. <clears throat> so what can we do? 
we as a community, as the Google Developer Groups, we come to a few things. The first one is the color coded badges that uh, Raphael just announced. So, green, come talk to me. Yellow, come to me only if I know you. And red is really not, not right now. This is very useful for people that cannot read nonverbal expression. So, if you're going to talk to someone, you look at the badge and say, oh, this person actually is the one to be talked to right now. I didn't notice, but they look at the badge, oh, it's fine. But it also helps for people that cannot express in their verbal language easily. So it's like someone may be in a corner, but will be very willing to be approached to. So it allows this person to also express the communication preferences in a very easy and unambiguous way. These badges have been used on many autism conferences around the world, in a few tech conferences. I hope they will be very useful for us to tell people that have this problem say, come to us, we're gonna help you fit in. Um, please use the badges, reflect the right, uh, the right preference for you, um, please respect them when you're approaching someone. And the other thing we're doing is we're having a quiet room. Another condition that is uh, usually coming together with autism is uh, sensory processing disorder. It is a much common condition, uh, it's supposed to happen about 15 to 20 percent of the people, where your senses are more acute or less than average. So if your vision or your hearing is actually too fine, you're going to be overwhelmed easily. So the solution for this is to have a place where there are no li low lights, no noise, where you can go there, chill out, relax, and then you can come back into a place that may be overwhelming. So this is actually a very important place. Having a quiet room or a quiet time is, is very important for some people. It's not my case, but when you see someone with these problems, it's really, really important for them. So, so let's go to the important part. What can you do as, as individuals? Like companies are doing things already. Uh, Microsoft is stop doing face-to-face -face interviews for people with autism. Instead, they are bringing them in for one week, see how they work with the team, see how they perform, and if they do well, they just got hired. We really struggle with face-to-face -face interviews. It's really bad. Um, this other company that is uh, only employs people with Asperger's syndrome because of the attention to detail, this company does QA, and they are working at it. Okay, so as individuals, it's actually much simpler. This is a picture of my desk. Um, uh, another thing that people with autism usually do is to do self-stimulation or stimming, so that you have seen kids flapping hands, rocking back and forth. When you get older, you usually take a pen and you spin it around, or I don't know, you get a fidgeting cube, or you get these little things and you spin them while you're talking to help you settle down. And I have all this on my desk, and all my teammates are actually curious about it, and they come and they not, never made a big deal out of it. And it was something very natural, so this is the sort of thing we have to do. We have to accept each other quirks, and be accepting, be inclusive, actually maybe even try it. Steaming is not so different from fidgeting, actually. I have a great team, they are very supportive. So, Summarizing, you only thing you have to do is to be nice to these people. They have their quirks, they have their weirdness, but they don't mean it. If they don't look you in the eye, it's not that they don't want to talk to you. If they don't read your nonverbal language, they probably didn't get it. If they just walk away from a conversation in an awkward way, they probably didn't mean it. If they start steaming, they're probably trying to settle down. So just be accepting, be nice to them, don't make a big deal out of it, and just treat them as normal people. So how did you know it's autistic people need it. Says it's an invisible disability, right? And we actually do not want to be treated in a special way. We want to be treated the same as everybody else. So I will rephrase this into just be nice to other people. Doesn't matter. You don't have to know if they have autism or not. Just be more accepting, more tolerant, be more helpful. And if we do this, we just make the, the world a better place not just for the people of autism, but for everyone. Thank you.